the Sage Center on 24-hour alert. At its heart is a computer developed by a research team from MIT and IBM working with the Air Force. The Sage computer feeds the information for decisions by man in our missile age. Every scheduled flight across American frontiers is recorded ahead of time on IBM punch cards, then fed into the Sage computer. Now the computer can draw a picture of what is supposed to be in the sky at any moment. It continually compares this expected picture with the real picture as seen by radar. If a flying object does not belong, it appears on this viewing screen. There's one now at the right of the screen. They call it a blip, unknown flying object. Friend or foe, within seconds the Air Force will know. The officer fires a light gun at the target blip. This tells the computer to track the object. At the launching site, a long-range BOMOC missile is readied for firing. Now they ask the computer to calculate an intercept point. X marks the spot where the BOMOC missile would meet the moving target if fired immediately. The officer in charge makes the final decision. Fire. At the moment of launching, the BOMOC missile receives instructions from the IBM computer. As the missile screams toward target, radar keeps on tracking. With electronic control, the computer automatically adjusts the missile to meet any change in the target's flight. There is no escape. Intercept. This was a test, one of many successful tests of the Sage Beaumont security team, our new system of air defense. To be ready for the worst, so that the worst will never happen, test, test. now armed with instant electronic reflexes. The Sage computer, made by IBM, is another example of the vast new powers that man can achieve through the creative use of his mind. Strength for test. national defense. Speed for informed decisions. Service for a growing America. This is IBM. where America's peace of mind begins. Around the clock, radar's electronic eyes watch the skies and report what they see to SAGE, defense system of the United States Air Force. Here is a SAGE center on 24-hour alert. At its heart is a computer developed by a research team from MIT and IBM working with the Air Force. The SAGE computer feeds the information for decisions by man in our missile age. Every scheduled flight across American frontiers is recorded ahead of time on IBM punch cards, then fed into the Sage computer. Now the computer can draw a picture of what is supposed to be in the sky at any moment. It continually compares this expected picture with the real picture as seen by radar. If a flying object does not belong, it appears on this viewing screen. There's one now at the right of the screen. They call it a blip unknown flying object. Friend or foe, within seconds the Air Force will know. The officer fires a light gun at the target blip. This tells the computer to track the object. At the launching site, a long-range BOMOC missile is readied for firing. Now they ask the computer to calculate an intercept point. X marks the spot where the BOMOC missile would meet the moving target if fired immediately. The officer in charge makes the final decision. from the IBM computer. As the missile screams toward target, radar keeps on tracking. With electronic control, the computer automatically adjusts the missile to meet any change in the target's flight. There is no escape. Intercept. This was a test one of many successful tests of the Sage Beaumont security team, our new system of air defense. To be ready for the worst, so that the worst will never happen, America is now armed with instant electronic reflexes. The Sage computer, made by IBM, 
is another example of the vast new powers that man can achieve through the creative use of his mind. Strength for national defense. Speed for informed decisions. Service for a growing America. This is IBM, freeing man's mind to shape the future. This is where America's peace of mind begins. Around the clock, radar's electronic eyes watch the skies and report what they see through SHADE, defense system of the United States Air Force. Here is a SHADE center on 24-hour alert. At its heart is a computer developed by a research team from MIT and IBM working with the Air Force. The SHADE computer feeds the information for decisions by man in our missile aid. Every scheduled flight across American frontiers is recorded ahead of time on IBM punch cards, then fed into the SAGE computer. Now the computer can draw a picture of what is supposed to be in the sky at any moment. It continually compares this expected picture with the real picture as seen by radar. If a flying object does not belong, it appears on this viewing screen. There's one now at the right of the screen. They call it a blip. Hi. Let's do this. Um, so the first thing I was going to try to do was uh, I was kind of inspired by there was this nearly unprecedented multi-region ground stop of air traffic about a week ago. Um, it was last Monday on the 10th. And what that what a ground stop is, is uh, no more planes take off. And in fact, planes that were in the air were told that they had to land. The reason this happened is because of the North Korean missile test. Um, and it was like, yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. This kind of thing doesn't happen much. Um, and this is the kind of thing air traffic control was telling pilots. Well, uh, you just want to fly around, is that right? Uh, Zero Mike, Zero Mike, Echo. I need you to go ahead and land at Van Nuys at this time. Some sort of national security threat going on, and we are not allowing aircraft to maneuver in the area at the moment. Um, are you you got to land. There's some kind of national security thing going on. Flight 48, home and ground. Uh, just hold there right now. We have a ground stop. There's something going on. Uh, we might have to scramble fighters shortly. Just hold there. We might have to scramble fighters. Controllers didn't really know what was going on either. Uh, I mean, you can get a sense of kind of the chaos uh, and confusion involved. These are these were some like uh, flight strips that someone on Reddit posted. Um, and basically what it shows is that Everyone was told there's the ground stop. And then I think just a minute later, they said, nope, no stop. Go ahead, resume normal operations. Sorry. And then like less than a minute later, um, stop all departures. This is not a joke. And then seconds later, OK, the ground stop is canceled. So it was like, stop, go, stop, go. And this all happened within 10 or 15 minutes at most. Um, so it was a pretty weird thing and it, and this happened for the entire West coast. This was in effect, um, including Alaska and also Hawaii. And that hasn't happened apparently since nine 11, that they've had a multi-region ground stop. Uh, and I guess it was concerns over the North Korean missile launch. They didn't know what that missile was going to do. Um, but a friend pointed me at this that happened during the ground stop. This is LAX. I'm just playing back some ADSB exchange history. A United uh, Airlines jet was getting ready to take off, begins its takeoff roll, and as it's. Wing 75, we're up on hold short, runway 25 right stop. Please. 16, rejecting on the runway. So. What happened there was as it was accelerating, as it was, was doing its takeoff roll, as it was accelerating, the small plane on the left crossed the runway. And the United Airlines passenger jet had to reject their takeoff, so they just slam on the brakes. Uh, they, I mean, according to this, they reach at least 60 knots. I think I saw a data point, data point at 64 knots. 
I mean, this happens sometimes. Um, I saw, I was trying to look up how often this happens, and I saw one stat, which is like one out of two or 3,000 takeoffs. Um, nothing happened in this case, no bad outcome. Uh, the passenger jet just got back in line to take off. Uh, I think they said that they had to wait about 15 minutes for their brakes to cool down before they could take off again. They dumped all that energy into the brakes and they slammed uh, them on to avoid hitting the smaller aircraft. Um, but it just made me wonder, because this happened during the ground stop, I wondered if the, which was, seemed like it was kind of a confusing time for people, uh, if the chaos, the confusion, if the distraction and increased workload for controllers and for pilots too might have contributed um, to what happened here. And so I started wondering if I could check that, um, if I could look at the data and figure out if this... If this same thing happened at any other airports, if there were other rejected takeoffs, or maybe there's other anomalies I could try to find. Um, planes that were, you know, maybe it was a similar thing. Plane trying to land and someone's on the runway when they shouldn't. And the plane has to uh, go around. And I think that given ADSB exchange data, um, which is, you know, it's like ADSB information and uh, additional information, multilaterating planes that aren't broadcasting ADSB um, from multiple receivers to get their position anyway. So with ADSB, they broadcast their GPS coordinates. But a lot of planes that don't broadcast coordinates, you can still basically triangulate them and see where they are, uh, their position and their altitude. So using that info, I thought we might be able to process it all for the entire West Coast and see if we can find any other instances of this. Uh, so that's what I'm going to try to do. That's it. Uh, and I'm going to write it in Rust. I haven't I haven't thought through this code super far yet. Um, I do have the ADSB exchange data. That's one thing. Someone, um, a friend, sort of generously gave it to me um, in GeoJSON format. So that's that's the format we have to work with. Uh, we can take a look at what that looks like. Um, so it's a bunch of feature collection. It's basically a bunch of points with additional properties. So points are these 2D positions. Uh, oh, I, I should say before I start, I'm I'm not that great a Rust programmer. I'm not like that great. I'm not a pilot. I'm not that you know great of a uh, geographer. Um, I'm just gonna try to muddle through and see if we can get something interesting. Um, so these are 2D points on Earth plus additional properties: barometric altitude, uh, ground speed, uh, the IKO hex. Uh, which is kind of the unique identifier for the aircraft and a timestamp. Um, so I guess it's time to write some code. Oh shit. You motherfuckers. Uh, I mean, I never changed my desktop, so you missed all that. So let me just show you a couple cool things that you didn't get to see. Well, you heard that. You heard that. Uh, you didn't get to see that. There it is. These are the flight strips illustrating the uh, confusion. And then here's the rejected takeoff. What a knucklehead. What a what an amateur move. That's OK. See, well, in addition to all those other things. Wings, sir, five, sir, if I hold short, run away 25 right, stop, please. 16, rejecting on the runway. Ordering. Five, right, in addition to the all, the all the other things, I'm not. I'm not a streamer, so I barely know what I'm doing. This will probably break within 10 minutes, and I'll just have to abort. But until then, um, right, there's the GeoJSON data. This is like every aircraft on the West Coast for, I don't know, maybe an hour, maybe a couple hours. I'm not, I haven't really looked yet. Um, it's a lot of data. I like this VD tool. 
for looking at CSV and JSON. It's a lot of data, so this takes takes some time. Takes a really long time. Okay, so Alt Barra, this uh, barometric altitude field. Uh, it's probably feet, units of feet, or it can say ground. So we're to start out, we're mostly interested in aircraft that are on the ground that are at an airport on a runway or a taxiway. Um, hopefully they'll all say ground, but sometimes, you know, one thing about having this much data is you, you see like every misconfigured transponder or, you know, broken piece of hardware. So they're supposed to say ground when on the ground, there's a ground switch, but they don't always. But we'll start out just by looking at this stuff that says ground, I think. Um, so let's create a new project. Using cargo. I use VS Code. I've used Emacs for like 30 years, but VS Code is so good. One thing I like about VS Code is the uh, GitHub Copilot uh, neural model which gives you really good suggestions and often kind of writes some of the tedious code for you. Okay, here's our project. Cargo creates kind of a new skeleton project that you can compile and run. We'll do that if uh, all the streaming isn't using all my CPU. We'll try to compile it with whatever's left. God, it is using all my CPU. Let's just see. Uh, quite a bit. Well, we'll do what we can. Um, the Skeleton Project's just like a little hello world. Okay. Uh, the first thing, because we're reading GeoJSON, um, well, normally for JSON, I'd use third. Uh, the third crate for Rust for serialization of JSON deserialization it's great, but um, but there's actually a GeoJSON crate that might be better. So let's use that. Let's just try loading the data first of all. That's what we want. That writing example looks like it's going to be handy. Um, oh, there and there's a there's a GitHub Copilot suggestion. It's like, oh, you're using GeoJS, and you might want to use Sir too, but we're not going to, not yet. Um, okay. This is kind of what we want to do. We're going to read it from a file. Just stick it all in main right now. Oh, come on. This paste really take that long. This might be, this might not really work. Um, fine, let's paste that in main. Oh, wow, I just went to format. It's taking forever. Um, meanwhile, let's toggle screencast mode.
Maybe formatting just isn't working. There it goes. Okay. So we're just, I mean, we're just going to use the library and see what it kind of stuff it gives us. Yeah. Okay. So that was a nice little copilot suggestion there. Let's run it. Oops. I don't know if I can take how slow this is. This is what I get for streaming on a Mac, I guess. While that's compiling. Uh, yeah, while that's compiling, let's look at how to read from a file in Rust. I told you I'm not a very good Rust programmer. I'm new. Um, so basically what I do is I've written, I've written a few programs and I just kind of look back at those constantly to uh, see what the hell I did. I know I wrote. I know I read from a file here. I'm actually. I was once a young hotshot programmer, and now I'm just a middle-aged guy who never knows what he's doing. Uh, yeah, this will this will probably be have some file reading code. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh goodness, error handling. That's something we're gonna deal with too, right? Um let's just paste that in. Um for error handling these days, I like anyhow. I'm sure for a lot of people watching, if you know, if you know slightly more than me about Rust, which is probably like a large percentage of programmers, um, you're like, oh my god, this is so painful to watch. It's okay, and I would love to hear how I'm doing the wrong things because that's why, I, actually, that's why I, I really like watching people live stream because I love. I feel like there's this weird thing where I, you often don't get to see people coding um like how do they use their tools how do they just do the act of writing code what does that practice look like and everyone every time i watch someone they do something that i've never thought of and do something they, they work in a way that's totally different in some dimension than i than i do um and so i kind of love watching that stuff and learning okay so we've got anyhow I don't think we need it yet, uh, but let's change main to return an error. That was another copilot suggestion. Maybe that's not going to work. Okay, that's good. Oh, <laughs> our, our run that we were, our compile, our build and run worked finally uh, and completed. So yeah, there we go. That's what that geojson deserializes to. That's cool. Okay, so let's just try reading this whole giant thing now. Um, it doesn't like this. So we're just going to change this. Uh, what did I do for... Let's just check my ADSB exchange. You know what this reminds me of is my ADSB exchange API proxy. Which, for some reason, 
isn't showing up. Um, that's fine. We don't need to check it in GitLab. This is the kind of thing I'm sure is really painful for someone that knows Rust and just has this stuff memorized. Um, Oh, come on. Well, I know that I... I probably did the same thing here. Actually, you know what? We won't worry about it. We'll just panic if anything goes wrong. It's the right thing to do for now. Uh, okay. So we're going to read that big crown stop GeoJSON data file. Oh, please, God, Copa, just help me. Great, what Copilot thinks I want to open. We don't need to open the pretty one. Okay. But I do need to read the file, so let's look at this. Um, so I can talk a little bit about the strategy I was thinking. Um, so read the file, parse all the positions, and then to look for rejected takeoffs, we're looking for, we can just start off by looking for aircraft that are on the ground, accelerating, um, reach a threshold speed of I mean, like a typical taxi speed, I think is like 20 knots or something. So let's just say like reach a threshold of 50 knots. Um, if they go above that, we'll say they're, and they're accelerating, we'll say they're taking off. And then we look for anything that starts slowing down after that point. And we'll see if maybe that's a rejection. I mean, we have, and we do have one test case, this LAX uh, United Airlines rejection. Oh yeah, a buffered reader, of course. Of course, that's what we want. Okay. Mm -hmm. We'll do all this error, all the nice error handling stuff later, but for now it's that, which is cool. Um, love rust analyzer you got an error i do cool what's the fix this all right good do it my mousing is a little subpar today because I have my um, this thing on so my wrist was a little sore oh uh, yeah read from string we got to import that trait I'm probably gonna use the wrong terminology for all sorts of things probably in programming and aviation and uh, geojson who knows what okay we're not we're not gonna print that whole thing well Bucket. We're going to print the whole thing. Um, but, you know, because it's so much data, let's do it in release mode. Oh, God, I just finally took a look at the chat widget. 
Ignatz is there. Hi. <laughs> wow, that made me want to learn Rust. Rust is great. I love it. It's my number one language these days. My number one language used to be Python, but I kind of cannot bear it anymore. I think, I think because as I get older and my brain calcifies, I need, um, I need Rust's typing. I need Rust Analyzer, which does such a good job of telling me what I did wrong and how to fix it. And it's okay. I'm just going to accept that that's how I program now. Uh, but the end result is like a freaking fast program, fast as shit. It's amazing. I feel like I this is this this will get me some. Here's my controversial hot take. Uh, I spent all this time learning Clojure, and I love it. And I'm an old time Lisp programmer, and I still love Lisp, and I still love Clojure. But I do feel like I spent a there, I spent I feel like I spent a lot of time learning how to write Clojure, and there wasn't really a payoff in the way that I was hoping. Um, Rust, there was there was an effort to learn. Uh, there's a learning curve. There's some things that are different from other languages. But, oh my god, the payoff was freaking amazing. It was like fast as shit code. Oh shit, it's all one. It's all one line. Great. Okay. Anyway, it worked. So we parsed the giant data file. Um, let's just see what we... Oh god, come on. No, it's, it's too big. Um, okay, we know it's a feature collection. Let's just do like, just to get a sense of what this data looks like a little bit. Um, that's terrible, but it will kind of do the job. Oh my god! How, much, how long have I been? How long have I been, have I been streaming for? I was hoping to do about half an hour. Oh, yeah, about there. And all I've done is read a file and parse it. That's okay. It's my first. It's my very first live coding stream. Which could be worse. Uh, okay. Top level feature collection. So maybe maybe everything is in this one feature collection. I didn't I didn't create this data file. A friend gave it to me, which is why I don't happen to know the structure of it. How hard can it be, though? Okay, let's look at the GeoJSON. Great. Oh goodness, not very much here. It's okay. I mean, I guess what I want to do is I need to um, get build up positions or uh, collect the uh, collect the positions for every aircraft. Yeah, long directory. Right, geojs.csv. You should report me. You should report me because I'm swearing. I'm not, I don't know what I'm doing. There's really very little value here. The value could be, though, that somebody, I mean, this could be the thing where somebody looks at this and is like, what the fuck? This guy's terrible. I could do better than that. And that'd be great. And then they do it. Uh, so, yeah, I just want to, I guess I want to collect all the positions for each individual aircraft. So group, group by aircraft and then do this processing. So what happens if we just iterate over that first 
feature collection. And how do we do that? Process GeoJSON geometries. That sounds like what we want to do. Um, process GeoJSON. Oh, yeah, okay. Hey, that's so similar to what we want to do. We can just copy it. It's a small thing, but I, um, it's a small thing that also didn't just happen then. But one thing I like about VS Code with the Rust extension is that when you paste code in, it just fixes the indentation. Um, Okay. God, I have to wait so long for Rust Analyzer to tell me what mistakes I made. I'm not used to it. I'm I'm used to a much tighter feedback loop. Um, we're just gonna say anything else. the unexpected thing here. All right, so maybe as a goal, we'll just try to read the file, maybe get some sense. Uh, let's just try to get positions for the aircraft. Can we do that? Um, yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. We don't have a match geometry. The only geometry here is going to be a point, but that's okay. Just this is like hack and slash coding. We just want to get something working. Love these DMCA free lo fi beats. Um, so, does that work? This is how I do all my coding. It's the worst, except that it's actually super effective in getting things done. Yeah, that's kind of what we want. Let's just see what happens. Oh, good lord. Rust Analyzer is taking so long. How much? Oh my god. All my CPU is going to this beast. Python? <laughs> What's running? <laughs> and it keeps going up. The CPU keeps going up. I there's a built-in time limit here. I this stream can't go on much longer. Um okay, so we just have to import. Just have to import geometry. No, no, don't click. I meant to paste, meant to copy. Now I'm having fun. I'm getting loose. Oh, I did have. I drank like a. I had like a shot of scotch before I did this. So I was like, oh, I better get. I better get a little bit loose. Well, Rust Analyzer is not getting enough CPU to help me here, so. Oh. Wow, this is, it feels like a very old fashioned way of programming. Which is to say, trying to compile, seeing what the errors are, and then fixing them. I, I haven't done that in a long time. That's not the most efficient way to do it these days. 
I type it and then I see what gets read squigglies in VS Code. Um, I didn't even know if I'd be able to stream tonight because I was hoping I could. I've been wanting to try it, but uh, my kids have been like having trouble falling asleep. Last night, I was telling them a bedtime story, and it wasn't good enough. I was like, okay, it's done. Daddy's got to go do his stream now, but it wasn't good enough, so they made me stay and tell more, and I just got too tired, and I couldn't do it. Um, right now, my son wants me to make up Wild Kratz stories every night. Wild Kratz is an animated show about these two brothers, the Krat brothers. Oh, look, we got our points. Hell yeah. Oh my god, I could stop now, but I'm going to keep going. Um, so now we need the properties. We got the points. We got... Uh, what's in the point? Vac. Let's just see. Must be the coordinates, huh? You think? Oh. Hell now. Yeah. Um, I just forget what the what's the syntax for this. Um, so every night I have to make up a story about how the Wild Crab Brothers help their friend protect his chicken coop from wolves, mutant wolves. Stuff like that. And there's forest fields and pits, traps, lasers, cameras. It's a pretty high tech world. Okay, cool. We got latitude, we got longitude. Um, now we just need this other stuff. Forgot to check my font size. It's a little small, isn't it? It's just the worst. I'm the worst streamer. But the end result of this is we're going to have this thing that, you know, the FAA is going to find really useful. Um, yeah, we need the properties. I'm sure hoping there's going to be an example. Ooh, it's in the feature, is that right? It's a little... Okay, so what, we have to do it up here? Sure, thanks, Coviolet. That's what I wanted. Copilot, I love you. If you can get into the Google or the uh, GitHub Copilot early access program, I don't know. I just, you know, hit submit on the form and they said, yeah, here you go. Um, you should. I would hate to code without it. I know I know it was kind of controversial. People had a lot of opinions about it, about what might be wrong with it, but in my experience, it's just awesome. I can't use it at work though. Uh, because we're worried about leaking our secret code. We don't want them to train the model on our secret code and then, oh, look, it worked. Yes. Oh, my God. This is so amazing. Okay. So we got our, pro we got our positions. We got our properties. We're so close. This is, this is, we're going to be, we're going to be stopping soon because we're going to get 
to a good stopping point. Um, rename that. Um, Okay, so this is this is the table we're going to store this stuff in. Oh, now Rust Analyzer's decided to come back and help. Thank you. Love you. All right. How we can just do this, right? Look at this. GitHub knows where I want in Copilot. I mean, this is pretty. This is pretty impressive, right? Um, where did it even get my cow from? My cow doesn't appear anywhere in this code, but it. Oh, well, I don't know. God, I don't know what it knows. Maybe it maybe it got it from the shell. Anyway, that's what we want. Okay. Um, and then we want so actually So let's just die if it's not a point. If it is a point. We will return the flat long. Fix a return type. It's all coming together. Get that out of there. Okay, so we've got the unique, the aircraft's unique identifier. Um, got the coordinates. And now we just want to add uh, the court. So basically, this uh, aircraft hash map is going to be a map from ICAO string to vector of positions. Um, so let's. I know there's a. I know there's a more concise, clever way of doing this, but let's just say. So we want, if it's not already in the table, add, we're going to add an empty vector. And then I know there's a, I know there's a better, more efficient way to do this, but no big deal. Um, oh, look, Copilot knows what we want. Copilot, so awesome. Yeah, it's not always right though. Uh, what's the problem? Same thing. No. Oh God, this is going to be the worst. Uh, of course, aircraft has to be mutable. Okay. Um, so now this will return. Ash map. Oh God, no. Oh sure, we just need to return it. It's okay. Don't freak out. Mm, 
looks good. We have new format strings now in Rust, but this is okay. This is cool. Oh, uh, look at this. Let's see. So um, for rejected takeoff, I already described my thinking. The heuristic is look for something on the ground that um, starts off at maybe a low speed, accelerates, and eventually accelerates past the threshold of, say, 60 knots or 50 knots, um, and then decelerates. Something like that. Um, I was thinking for how to, how to, how to detect a go around. So this is when an aircraft is approaching the airport. It's on approach, maybe on final approach. Um, and it has to, it doesn't land. It increases power and flies off, um, because there was someone on the runway or whatever. Uh, for that, I was thinking, well, you could start by just looking for planes that are going a little bit slowish, whatever that is. Um, their altitude is decreasing. Um, yeah, how to how to tell that from a touch and go? Well, I guess a touch and I mean, right? Because there's a million million. Uh, there's a bunch of pilots that are practicing their takeoffs and landings and everything and there's so they're doing pattern work and there's a million touches and goes um, so I guess hopefully the touch and go will have I mean the, the touch and go is kind of similar like the go around is you're coming down and then you go back up touch and go is you go down all the way you're on the runway and then you take off again um, Ignatz, I did not even think about the touch and go problem. Thank you. But uh, I think, I mean, the first, I guess the first cut is you just look for someone who actually was on the ground and you remove those. I have a feeling that that's not going to be good enough, but it, it might be a start. Um, and I was trying to think of like, well, is it any aircraft that's kind of descending and maybe below some, uh, you know, minimum threshold altitude. So they have to get below, you know, 200 feet or 500 feet or something like that. And we'll just, we'll assume that anyone going that low is trying to land. Eh, maybe that might work. Um, and not even worry about where airports are. But then uh, it's actually, it's not that hard, I think, to get to uh, find some data telling us the location of, well, basically every runway is what we want to know. Um, location of every runway and even the orientation of the runway. Um, so we can make sure they're lined up, they're descending and lined up on a runway. That's the first cut. I mean, theoretically, you could even see if you could find the you know, aircraft that was on the runway that caused them to go around. We might have data for that. One problem is that the uh, ADSB receivers have a little bit of a harder time picking up stuff at low altitude. Um, so you might not see the aircraft if they're on the ground. Uh, okay, so wait, what happened? This didn't work. Oh, no entry, no entry found for key. Um, Really? Because it's called hex, not IKO. Is 
Is this music too loud? Okay. Almost 7,000 aircraft. Cool. Um, I think the next part then is going to be... Well, we got to get... Actually, we need to build up a little more info about all these aircraft, don't we? So let's say... Um, aircraft state. Yeah, I think that's what we want. Um, no, that's not what we want, Copilot. I don't know what it thinks. Position, lat long or long lat. Uh, no, we don't care about velocity, Copilot, but we do care about altitude. Let's make it a float for now. Uh, we do care about speed, ground speed. And we do care about time, I guess. I don't know. Let's leave it out for now. Maybe we don't need it. That'd be a little radical. Okay, so let's just parse out these things in the dumbest way. Uh, we have position and hacks. We need altitude. That's not quite what we want, go pilot, but you're not you're not that far off. Okay. I think this one we can just do this. See how much time copilot saves me? Yeah, I know we don't have a parse altitude yet. Okay, maybe I'll stop if... Oh, the music is barely audible. Okay, that's cool. I'll... I think it's louder for me. Let me know if that's too loud. Uh, so I'm just making this parse alt function because I want to convert ground altitudes to zero. For now. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. Dude, I'm telling you, Copilot is so good. Everyone should be using it. Uh, I mean, I don't know if there's a downside. It, it's not always right, and I have to fix errors. Uh, but net effect is it saves a hell of a lot of time. All right. And I don't even think it's, I don't even think Rust is its strongest language. Uh, when I do Python, it can write like a whole function. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to push this aircraft state. Rename. No, not that. Uh, Uh, here's what we want to rename. Okay. Go. Created our little struct. Let's derive debug so we can print it if we need to. Uh, right. No longer a vec of coordinates. Oh, let's just check. Um, yeah, I don't have the United Airlines, but my tweet has it. Uh, Uh, 
I just want to find the uh, my KO hex ID. Really? I didn't put it in there. Okay. That's okay. All right. I just wanted to print some stuff out. Let's. Uh... Can we just get the first thing? I'm just going to trust. No, oh, no. Okay. Copilot didn't. Or no, I think I wrote that. Not Copilot. Yeah, we never use those fields. Well, but we do print them. Or maybe we don't. Maybe this code's wrong. I have I have IRC window. Uh, my IRC window is hidden behind my camera feed, so I see what you're saying about me in IRC. Oh, really? Okay. Um, so yeah, if there's, so, so it, uh, panicked because there was no alt barrow value or property. Um, okay. So if there's no... There's no altitude, we're just going to ignore it. Yep, that's right, Copilot. Exactly what I wanted. We'll just continue to skip it. Uh, it's probably going to happen. This speed, too, but let's just see. This data is, it's a lot of data. Whenever you have a lot of data that's like kind of dirty, uh, it's like you always have to code pretty defensively. This was this. Was, I remember when I was at Google writing Sawzall scripts, and it's like, oh, I'm just gonna check, um, you know, something like basically whatever you were looking for. It's like, well, I'm just gonna run this query over every hit to YouTube, every request to YouTube, and. I mean, there's so many that no matter what weird ass thing you think could never happen, it happens like a hundred thousand times a day. Um, so your scripts had to basically could assume nothing. Okay, so of course there was no altitude. So if there's no altitude abort, or I mean, uh, wait, what? Hold on. <laughs> I wrong? What did I say? It died on 27. Oh, because it. Uh... Because why? I couldn't parse it. If it doesn't have parametric altitude, continue. Oh, maybe it's a null or something. Uh, this is ugly, but... Thank you again, Copilot. The music I want to stream, I can't because, you know, I'll get copyright hits from Twitch. This is, um, this is my scotch. This is a glass that Amy gave me for Christmas. 
It's got a Los Angeles map etched in it that's impossible to see, but there it is. So now why? Um, oh, is it, of course, not a string? It's a string or a number. Is that true? God. Is that why it's happening? Uh, Oh, less is going to die. Yeah, it's a number. Okay. Um, so we'll just pass the raw value in. It is a geojson value. Yeah, that's kind of what we want. It's a number as F64. If it's a string, then we'll kind of do this. We're going to assume the only string is ground. If it's not, something went wrong. Okay. Uh, what's happening here? Got too many brackets? Yeah. Oh. It's a Sared. I knew Sared was going to get into this one way or another. Uh, sure. Now, we need to add it to cargo. So let's get the right version. Oh, it's late. I gotta stop. Okay, we did far enough. We got, we got something. We'll do more later. This is just part one. Um... Yeah, this is it. Thanks for being here. We're gonna we're gonna do more. All right. Good night.